Daniel, Crest, Eric and the rest of the boys of the Bjorna Brodre were celebrating their victory over Algar's fur. They were singing and laughing the way only very excited boys could. Their war horns were being blown almost constantly, letting everyone for miles around know that they had defeated their longtime rivals. They were patting themselves on the back and congratulating one another on a job well done, seemingly having forgotten that their victory had been the work of Amaron. The young dragon was reclining in the central courtyard of Stajan's festening, picking the splintered pieces of Algar's arrows out from under his eye. He watched the boys celebrating and snorted in amusement. They had already forgotten all about him. Amaron could hear them coming up with new songs concerning their victory and he noted that he was mentioned only in passing. Amaron smiled and chuckled to himself. That was perfectly all right by him. He didn't really care about being in their ballads. He had already been immortalized by old Aldred for killing Malgers and that was enough for Amaron. Let them have all the glory, Amaron smiled to himself as he watched them celebrate. The golden banners had all been thrown down and replaced with the red flags of the Bear Brothers. Stajan's festening was theirs and they meant for everyone to know it. Outside the wooden walls Amaron could hear a thunderous noise that shook the ground under him. It was the combined horse herds that had formerly belonged to Algar. Crest had ordered the beasts to be set loose from their stables in celebration of his victory. The horses which numbered somewhere around five to six hundred were currently galloping in a huge circle around Stajan's festening. Their whinnying and neighing filled the air and added to the deafening tumult of their hooves. Myra and Asa were watching the stampeding animals from atop a nearby hill. They gawked at the herd in awe. What impressed them was that all of the beasts had belonged to a single child. Granted that particular child was over 870 years old but Algar was still young for an Arthurian. So many, Myra said to herself. I can smell them from here, said Asa with a wrinkled nose. Having come from Empire City he had never seen anything larger than a rat or a cat or an occasional stray dog. It was only recently that he had seen the outside world and all its wonders. If you think that herd is impressive, said Tiller, you should see my father's herd. He has 3,000 of them. I believe you, said Myra, still watching the stampede. The horses seemed to be moving in slow motion to her eyes. They were tossing their long manes and whinnying in delight as they galloped. Their unshod hooves torn up the soft earth, causing clumps of dirt and grass to fly up with each step they took. Myra could see that a circle was being rutted into the ground around the fort. If they keep going like that they'll end up digging a moat, Myra thought. Suddenly she wondered if that was what Crest had intended in the first place when he had released them. Myra turned to Tiller and asked, so what happens now? What do you mean? replied Tiller. I mean what happens to Algar and the rest of his fur. The members of Algar's fur will be made to join Crest's, replied Tiller, as for Algar himself, I'm not sure what Crest has in store for him. You mean he's going to hold him prisoner? asked Asa. Of course, laughed Tiller, and you would too if you had been feuding with him for over 500 years. I'm happy I'm not part of this fur thing, said Asa. That can be mended if you want, offered Tiller. Ah, uh, no, er, uh, Asa began to say, thank you for the suggestion but I'm perfectly fine where I am. If you say so, said Tiller, slightly bewildered that Asa didn't want to join. Where's Algar now? asked Myra. If I know Crest, said Tiller, he has him locked up in his deepest, darkest cell in his dungeon. He has one, said Myra, her eyes widening. Yes, and a very strong one as well, replied Tiller, I remember when I was made a prisoner by Algar about, oh now how long ago was it, 300 years or so ago. He imprisoned you, said Myra, aghast, why? To make Crest angry, explained Tiller, Algar caught me while I was treating his wounded fur mates. He accused me of treating Crest's band with more care and skill than his. He said that he was punishing me for my favoritism. Did you? asked Myra. Show favoritism. No, of course not, said Tiller. Healers are supposed to tend to the wounded, no matter which side they are on or who they are. Your father must have been angry, said Asa. No, not really, said Tiller. He was a little annoyed but nothing else beyond that. Why? asked Myra. I asked him the exact same question when I saw him afterwards, said Tiller, he said that if I intended to ply my healing skills among the fur then I had to be prepared to be sucked into their games and politics. Why would holding you prisoner make Crest angry? asked Asa. Crest and I have been friends for centuries, explained Tiller, if one of your lifelong friends was suddenly thrown into a cell for no good reason wouldn't you be a little upset? So Algar only threw you into his dungeon just so he could annoy Crest, said Myra. 
Well it wasn't his dungeon per se, said Tiller, I was given my own chamber, which Algar furnished at his own expense and he gave me all the privacy I wanted. He didn't starve me or mistreat me. On the contrary, I was made his hostess whenever he threw a feast which seemed to be every other week now that I remember. I was treated with honor. He also gave me one of his younger sisters to be my handmaiden while I was in Stajan's festening. My stay there wasn't altogether uncomfortable but it was still a gilded cage. How did you escape? asked Myra. How else? giggled Tiller. Crest snuck in and rescued me. He crawled over the walls in the dead of night, knocked out my guard and tied up Algar's sister, after I swapped dresses with her to disguise myself of course. That must have made her mad, laughed Asa. Actually she was perfectly fine with it, said Tiller, she had been forced to stay in Stajan's festening for as long as I was there. She was homesick after the first few weeks of our captivity because she was as much a prisoner as I was. What happened next? Myra asked, leaning closer. Crest and I slipped out of my chamber and we snuck back to where he had first climbed over the wall. We shimmied down a rope that he had tied to one of the timbers and we were then outside the walls. It was right over there actually. Tiller pointed to a portion of Stajan's festening's outer wall. Once we were outside we jumped onto the back of Crest's pony and rode off into the night as fast as we could. It didn't take Algar long to find out what had happened. He was furious and tracked us with his riders well into the morning. He would have recaptured me if Crest hadn't pushed his steed past the breaking point. We passed the border of his territory just as Algar caught up to us. Fortunately Crest's fur mates were out on patrol and fended him off. And thus I was rescued. Sounds like something out of a fairy tale, said Asa. Fairies don't have tails, scoffed Tiller, only pixies do. I didn't mean, Asa began to say but then thought better of it. Myra smiled at Asa and shook her head. Asa, my whole life for the past month sounds like something out of a fairy tale, she said, if someone had told me that I'd be whisked away on an adventure on the back of a dragon and taken to a place where the people live forever, I would have told them that they were crazy. And you would still be right, laughed Asa, I'm still pinching myself to make sure that I'm not dreaming. Well if you two are only dreaming this, said Tiller, at least have the good sense to make it have a happy ending before you wake up. I promise that I won't make this into a nightmare if you don't, chuckled Asa. Agreed, said Myra. Just as they were about to remount their ponies and ride down to the fort, Myra's sharp eyes caught movement on the horizon. She scanned the area and saw what had attracted her attention. It was a set of banners flapping and flying in the breeze. One was red and the other was gold. Tilla saw them at the same moment Myra did. They're early, she said as she urged her mount to a walk. Who is it? asked Asa. His human eyes were weaker than those of elves and half-elves. Who are you looking at? It's Lord Carla and Emmett, answered Tilla. They've come to judge the conquest. Judge the conquest? echoed Myra. What do you mean? Whenever one of the fur takes over new territory from one of the others the conquest is judged, said Tiller, there are rules that have to be followed, there can't be any interference from any adults and no sharp weapons can be used. Those are only two rules but there are many others. If any of the fur break these rules then the conquest is judged to be invalid. Any land and treasures that were won must be given back to the losers. Does this judging happen after every fight? asked Myra. Only for big battles, answered Tiller, goodness. If every skirmish, ambush, kidnapping and cattle raid were judged then the fur would never get anything done. They'd be too busy worrying about breaking the rules. They rode on towards Stajan's festening. Crest's lookouts had spotted the two chieftains riding towards them with their entourages of banner men and housegirls. Several boys galloped out of the gates with lassoes twirling over their heads. They rode into the stampeding horse herd and roped the stallions and mares that were leading the rest. The riders drove the whinnying and snorting mass away from Stajan's festening to graze and rest in the surrounding fields. Once this had been accomplished the boys from both fur sallied out of the gates and arranged themselves into ranks. They stood at ramrod straight attention with their wooden weapons and shields in their hands. Once the chieftains had drawn closer, a roaring cheer rose up from the boys, hailing their elders and praising their honored names. They clashed their arms against their shields as the chieftains rode up to them. Hail to the tribe of bears, cried some. Hail to Carla the Great, others shouted. Hurrah to the tribe of stags, others cried. Hail to Emmett Errolson, more yelled. They're trying to gain their approval, Tiller explained to Myra and Asa. They think that if they do, then maybe they'll judge in their favor. Will they? 
asked Myra, raising her voice above the din of voices. Maybe on Carla but not on Emmett, answered Tiller, he's too honorable to have his decision swayed by having his name called out. So Carla's got the bigger ego, noted Asa, I'll have to remember that. As he said this Carla dismounted his steed, a big white shire horse named Magni, meaning, mighty, in the common speech. The horse whinnied and tossed his head as Carla untied his long-hafted bearded axe from the saddle. The Arthurian chieftain was a giant of a man. He was well over six and a half feet tall and had to weigh at the very least 300 pounds of pure lean muscle. His black hair was cut short and his dark eyes were keen and bright. He had a bright red tunic of spun wool and a male hauberk of riveted black iron rings. His immense black books rose up to just belong his knees and his shins were protected by splintered greaves. His forearms were clad in thick leather braces which were covered in intricate designs and interwoven patterns. A broad leather belt was wrapped around his middle and was fastened in place with a big silver buckle which was fashioned in the shape of a bear's paw. Carla looked very fearsome, which indeed he was. His past deeds of valor and bravery were the stuff of legends. He towered over the youngsters that stood before him and smiled a big teddy bear smile. Then Emmett dismounted his horse and stood before the gathered youths. He was smaller than Carla but no less famous or formidable. He stood a head shorter than the larger chieftain and was 200 pounds lighter. He had dark brown hair and green eyes. He wore a golden yellow tunic and a male hauberk of polished steel rings, trimmed in brass. His braces and greaves were also made of gilded brass and were likewise decorated with etchings of woven patterns and designs. He held a long steel-tipped spear in his right hand. Both men wore sheathed broad-bladed swords at their right sides. The youngsters cheered and howled their chieftains' names and their many titles that they had won over the long millennia. Bonebreaker, Goblin Cleaver, Troll Hunter, Horse Tamer, Giant Killer and Ogre Slayer were only some of the names that the youths called the two men. The chieftains shared a knowing smile at each other and then rose their hands over their heads. The youths went silent and stood still. Well, Emmett, said Carla, it appears you owe me 100 silver pennings. I told you that my boys could do it. So it would seem big brother, replied Emmett, so it would seem. Stajan's festening can never be taken. It's too strong. Those were your words to me, remember. I remember, sighed Emmett. And now look. My boys. My boys have taken it by storm, cried Carla with pride swelling his broad-barreled chest. I can see, Carla. No need to rub it in, said Emmett, giving the bigger man a look that warned him against any further boasting. Very well, replied Carla, taking a step towards the ranks of youths. So, which of you will be the first to tell us how the battle occurred? Emmett asked the boys. A hundred hands shot up all at once. Carla laughed a deep booming laugh. One at a time, little cubs, one at a time. Where are the fur chiefs? asked Emmett. Crest stepped forward, beaming with pride. His fur mates cheered and clashed their wooden weapons and shields together. A horn was blown and could be heard echoing out across the fields for minutes afterwards. Where is Algar? asked Emmett. He's, indisposed at the moment, my lord, replied Crest with an impish smirk. He was supposed to be released the moment you saw that we were coming, said Emmett, crossing his arms over his chest. Yes, my lord, I know, replied Crest. Then why didn't you, asked Emmett. To teach him a lesson in humility, answered Crest. Along with a goodly amount of personal revenge, eh, chuckled Carla. Crest grinned slyly in reply. That is unacceptable, cried Emmett, go and release him at once. At once, my lord, replied Crest with a bow of his head. He turned but instead of going off to free Algar he motioned to Eric and ordered him to go. Eric bowed his head and trotted off. Carla laughed and clapped Emmett on the back with his big paw. Ha! Forgive Crest for his petty revenge, said Carla, don't you remember your days in the fur and how you and your rivals avenged one another? I remember, replied Emmett. Eric entered through the smashed gates and disappeared into the fort. It was at that moment that both Carla and Emmett noticed how badly the gates had been damaged. They looked at each other with confused faces and then gazed about for the battering ram that Crest must have used to smash the gates. They couldn't see it anywhere. How did you break that? Emmett asked Crest, pointing to the shattered gateposts. With a little help, replied Crest. As he spoke the sound of Algar's shouting and cursing could be heard. Both Emmett and Carla looked up to see Eric pushing Algar before him. The former leader of the Heart Lancers was shirtless and his hands were tied behind his back. His dark locks were ruffled and he had a black eye. 
As Algar and Eric stepped out of the gates they were followed by Amaron who had been hidden by the high wooden walls of the fort. When the two chieftains saw the dragon they both gave one another a worried look. Cheetah. Algar screamed at Crest as Eric pushed him towards his arch-rival. When he was close enough to Crest, Algar spat at him. My lords, he cried when he saw Carla and Emmett standing over him, I have been wronged. This honorless son of a fatherless goat has cheated his way to victory. He paid the dragon to break down my doors and to terrify my fighters into surrendering. You must judge his victory to be invalid. You must brand him as a cheater. Is this true? asked Emmett. Yes, admitted Crest, I asked Amaron for his help in taking the fort. I told him that I would pay him in cattle and I gave my word that our bargain would be honored. You see, cried Algar, he confesses his guilt. He has broken the rules of the fur, no adult is allowed to interfere among the fur. But you broke the rules as well, Algar, growled Amaron as he approached, stepping over the gathered boys as easily as a man steps over a low fence. What do you mean? asked Carla. Amaron lowered his head and pointed at the wound under his right eye. Algar shot me with an arrow that had its blunted head broken off, rumbled the dragon, in fact he shot me a number of times with sharpened arrows. I assume that using pointed staves is forbidden among the fur. I only broke off the blunted heads because you were attacking my fortress, shouted Algar. You're wrong, grunted Amaron, I hadn't attacked your fort yet. In fact you technically attacked me first when you threw your wooden sword at me. You were attacking my fort, insisted Algar, the fire of anger and rage burning in his eyes. Carla and Emmett looked at each other in total confusion. How do we judge? asked Carla. Crest broke the rules by getting Amaron involved, replied Emmett, no adults are allowed to interfere. But that rule only applies to Arthurians, elves, humans and dwarves, counted Carla, the rules don't say anything about involving dragons. That's because no one has ever been crazy enough to do so before now. Replied Emmett, giving Crest a sidelong glance. That is true, admitted Carla, but no one was anyone crazy enough to involve a herd of Madox before you did. Emmett's face flushed red at being reminded of what had been the rashest action of his childhood. At hearing this Myra turned to Tilla and asked her what Carla was talking about. When Lord Emmett was a child he tricked a herd of Madox into stampeding into his rival's territory, said Tilla, he used the chaos and confusion to sneak his army into the opposing fort and to capture it. What's a madoc? asked Asa. A madoc is like an elephant, only much hairier and with bigger tusks, replied Tilla. You mean a woolly mammoth, cried Asa. Woolly mammoth. I guess that's what your people would call them, answered Tilla. It certainly describes them accurately from what I've heard about them. What have you heard about them? asked Myra, suddenly curious to hear more about the prehistoric creatures. My father told me that vast herds of them roam across Arthuria, replied Tilla, when we get there you'll be able to see them for yourself. But they're extinct, said Asa. Are they? asked Tilla. Asa nodded in reply. They've been extinct for over 5,000 years, said Myra, or at least that's what my textbook said when I was studying them in school. Oh, moaned Tilla disappointed, and I was so looking forward to seeing one for myself when we go home to Arthuria. If I remember correctly, said Carla as he scratched his chin, that conquest was judged to be valid. Yes it was, admitted Emmett. And furthermore, continued Carla, your deed was so unprecedented that a new rule was added, the fur may use wildlife to their advantage. I remember, nodded Emmett. I am not an animal, snarled Amaron. Well if you say you're not an animal, said Emmett, that complicates matters. You see, cried Algar, even the dragon admits his guilt. He knows that Crest is nothing but a, shut up. Carla, Emmett, Amaron and Crest growled at the same time. I still say that the conquest is valid, argued Carla. And I say that it is not, replied Emmett. The two men began arguing over which rules had been violated and which ones had been obeyed. Emmett reasoned that since Amaron wasn't an animal he counted as an adult. Carla counted that since Crest had promised to pay Amaron for his troubles that the rule concerning no adults had been superseded by the rule concerning honoring all agreements. As the two men spoke the gathered youths leaned in closer to hear what they were saying. They nervously awaited their fates to be decided. Finally after many minutes of arguing back and forth the debate came to an end. It appears we have come to an impasse, said Carla. Agreed, replied Emmett, now I know how that poor Jarl felt after I pulled my stunt. So how shall we decide? Carla asked. You favor Crest while I favor Algar, replied Emmett, we must break the tie. Again I ask how, said Carla. 
We could call for one of the other chieftains to come in and give his opinion, offered Emmett. Bah, that'll take too long, scoffed Carla, besides you know that they're all too busy at the moment. So how shall we choose a winner? Emmett asked. The two men looked at Crest and Algar, then back to each other. They smiled and nodded. Home gang, said Carla. Home gang, echoed Emmett. At hearing this the gathered youths uttered such an excited cry that it caused Myra's pony to rear up in fright, nearly throwing her. Bayaz. Easy girl, cried Myra as she held on. The little white pony whinnied, pawed the ground with its hooves and snorted as the she-elf patted her neck. It's, okay, Bayaz, she whispered into the foal's ear. The boys continued to roar and cheer. They were howling with utter joy, the kind of joy that only warriors could feel at the onset of a battle. Home gang, they cried, home gang. What's a home gang? Asa asked Tilla. It's a type of duel, she replied, they're going to fight to decide who wins. As Tilla spoke the boys began stamping their feet and bashing their wooden weapons against their shields to an even rhythm. Almost as soon as they did this they started singing songs of glory and battle. One of the songs went something like this. The spear is sticking in the ground. The shield is broken and undone. But the invasion will always fail. For we are mighty warriors. The viscera and blood is a gift. To the spirits of our kings. May they help us reach the field of our glory. Over the sea and through the fire. Though we fall with death in fighting. We will come to heaven's land. Nothing stopped us. Nothing broke us. Our fathers await us in the golden halls of our God. Our weapons and shields be laden. With the power of our valor. We will fight at our bravest. Side by side we make our stand. We will cross the ocean of reeking blood. Through the great booming thunder of the distant storm. Our enemies are close. They are coming towards us. We can see the fear in their eyes. We will face them in this battle because our oaths to our fathers we will stay and we will fight over the sea and through the fire. Though we fall with death in fighting, we will come to heaven's land. Nothing stopped us. Nothing broke us. Our fathers await us in the golden halls of our God. I smell blood around. Carrion birds are flying through the skies. My axe is broken and falls to the ground. But I will continue to fight. My fate belongs to God. But before the day I die, I shall earn the right to join my fallen brothers. Over the sea and through the fire, Though we fall with death in fighting, we will come to heaven's land. Nothing stops us. Nothing breaks us. Our fathers await us in the golden halls of our God. Many more songs were sung and each one was just as war happy as the next. Myra later learned that home gangs were rarely used among the fur to settle disputes for a number of different reasons. Sometimes the fur would train one of their members to become a master duelist to ensure victory. At other times the combatants would not stop fighting each other even when wounds and exhaustion had taken their toll. The reason for this was because whenever a home gang was fought the outcome was always final, the victor's actions were declared legitimate and nothing the loser said or did could alter that. Myra later learned that during the past 500 years the home gang had only been fought seven times. Today would be the eighth. Quiet, shouted Emmett, raising his arms up for silence, quiet, all of you. Now that that's settled, said Carla, fingering the blade of his bearded axe, who will we let fight in this home gang? By the look in your eye I guess that you want us to be the ones, said Emmett, gripping the heft of his lance. Do you think that you could take me, little fawn? asked Carla with a smirk. Ah, the question should be, can you best me, little bear, replied Emmett with a laugh. The two men smiled at each other and began to circle one another. The gathered boys were dead silent as they watched the chieftains. After a moment, however, Carla stopped and wagged his finger at Emmett. Let's not break our own rules, eh? He said, if we fought on their behalf we would be breaking the no adult rule. Agreed, said Emmett, let the fur chiefs fight it out between themselves. At hearing this Algar struggled viciously against the leather cords that bound his hands behind his back. Eric attempted to cut him loose but Algar was thrashing and flailing so much that he feared that he might accidentally stab him and thus backed away. Algar cursed and spat as he reeled against his bindings. At last there was a loud snap and he stood free, hot and sweating from the effort. He clenched his raised fists and glared at Crest. I. Will. Break. You. He snarled. Perhaps, replied Crest, but you'll always remember that I took both your fort and fur from you. Algar spat at him. The gathered boys formed a large circle around the two fur chiefs and walled them in with their shields. 
A large mat made from animal skins was rolled onto the ground and the two boys stepped onto it. They took hold of their wooden weapons and rounded shields and faced each other. Crest had removed both his chainmail and padded gambeson and wore only his red tunic and black leather vest. Algar stood shirtless, his skin already glistening with sweat. The sun was very hot that day. You both know the laws of the home gang, Emmett said in a loud voice so all could hear him. The first one to be beaten off the mat or calls for mercy loses the match. No mercy will be asked for, smirked Crest. Or given, growled Algar. In that case, boomed Carla, fight well. Strike with honor, and give us a good show. With a wave of his huge paw the bout was on. Algar charged towards Crest, the fire of his wrath twisting his face into a horrifying visage. He rose his wooden sword over his head and brought it crashing down with all his might. If Crest hadn't raised his shield to deflect the blow he would certainly have been either knocked out or perhaps even killed. The gathered boys howled as the fight raged on. Each blow that was struck was repaid with double force. Crest wouldn't have admitted this to anyone but for the first time during all their long rivalry he was frightened of Algar. The battle fury was on him, blinding him to everything else. Algar couldn't feel either weariness or pain at that moment. All he felt was the fire in his belly, driving him on. His sole purpose for existing was to defeat Crest as far as he was concerned. He hacked and slashed and jabbed and stabbed at his enemy with wild abandon. Algar howled like a wolf and roared like a bear. His eyes wild and terrifying. He had gone completely berserk. He's going to kill him, cried Myra. I'm glad I'm not in the fur, Asa said to himself as he looked on. Daniel was beginning to wish that he hadn't joined the fur. He recalled his duel with Eric when he had first enlisted and he remembered thinking that Eric had to have been the best fighter in the whole sanctuary. But now as he looked on, he saw that his bout with Eric had been downright tame by comparison to the battle that was being fought before him. Note to self, never get Algar angry at me, he thought as he watched. Crest felt as though he were a poor piece of iron being smashed by a blacksmith's hammer as Algar came at him. At that moment Algar struck such a heavy blow against his shield that Crest felt the vibration travel down his arm and shoulder and rattle his teeth in his gums. He cried out and staggered back a step. Algar pushed on relentlessly, pummeling Crest with blow after blow. Crest's once decorated red shield was now a pitted and scored board, the device on the face having been completely worn away. Algar's sword was heavily notched and chipped with each whack. The gathered boys cheered their respective leaders on. Give it to M, Algar roared one boy, hammer him, crest, cried a second, pound him into the ground, howled a third, go for his legs, shouted a fourth, bash him with your shield, the first boy screamed, Algar must have heard the last cry because he held up his shield which was just as battered as crests and then punched it forward with all his might, the three centimeters thick iron boss struck crest full in the face, a river of blood flowed from his broken nose and he fell flat on his back, a cry of anguish rose up from the members of the Bear Brothers while the boys of the Heart Lancers shouted for joy. Algar was on top of Crest almost as soon as he fell. He stood over him and pounded him with his wooden sword. Crest held up his wooden shield to protect himself and simultaneously struck at Algar's feet with his own weapon. The wooden blade caught him on the ankle, causing Algar to jump back. The bone was cracked and Algar hopped on his good leg while Crest staggered to his feet. Sweat dripped into Crest's eyes. Blood poured from his nose, flowing into his mouth. He blinked the sweat away and spat out the blood towards Algar. To his bemusement he saw that the spittle had hit his face. Enraged, Algar roared and charged forwards. Crest readied his shield and braced himself. Their shields collided but Algar kept going, his forward momentum carrying him along. Using his enemy's motion to his advantage Crest levered his shield under Algar and threw him over his back. Algar landed on his head behind Crest, knocking him senseless for a moment. He had fallen beyond the boundary of the mat. Crest had won. It took a moment for everyone to realize this. Crest was the first. When he threw Algar he had quickly spun around to strike at him but then he saw that his enemy was lying face down in the green. He's off the mat, thought Crest as the realization struck him. He cast aside both his sword and shield and cheered. When he did this his fur mates howled for joy. The members of the Heart Lancers looked on in sheer disbelief. They had lost. How could they have lost? They looked dumbfounded at each other and were altogether bewildered and flummoxed at this turn of events. Alfgear rushed to Algar's side to make sure that he was unharmed. When he broke ranks every last member of the Bjorna Brodre charged forward. 
they picked up Crest and carried him on their shoulders, cheering and howling in the joy of victory. Crest laughed and cheered along with them and then jumped from their shoulders onto the platform of their appraised shields. It is decided, boomed Carla, his face beaming with pride. The Bjorna Brodre's conquest of Stajan's fasting is valid. The heart lancer fur is no more. I concede to your judgment, said Emmett with a bow of his head. Crest whooped and hollered for joy at hearing this. The rest of his fur cheered. We've won, we've won, they cried. Crest was smiling from ear to ear as he looked down at his brothers. They had done it. They had finally beaten Algar. It had taken 500 years of near constant feuding but victory had been achieved. It tasted just as sweet as Crest dreamed it would. But then he tasted an iron tang on his tongue and felt something warm flowing into his mouth. Suddenly the euphoria of the triumph left him as his adrenaline levels returned to normal. His pain washed over him like a wave. Crest leapt off the appraised shields and fell to his knees, holding his face in his hands. Most of his fur took no notice of this and continued to shout, cheer and celebrate. Several of them started to dance funny little jigs while Crest knelt. His nose felt as though it were on fire. Tears welled up in his eyes and trickled down his cheeks. He felt a hand on each of his shoulders. When he looked up he saw both Daniel and Eric squatting in front of him. They were both grimacing. Bad? asked Crest. Very, said Daniel, his face turning white at the sight of so much blood. I'm honestly shocked that you still have your teeth, noted Eric. Crest sucked and licked his front teeth to make sure that they were still there and also to ensure that they hadn't been knocked loose. By some miracle none of them had. So am I, replied Crest. Make way, he heard Tilla cry. He looked up to see her making her way through the crowd towards him. Myra and Asa were close behind her. She knelt in front of him and put her healing skills to work. Tilla withdrew a handful of dried leaves from a pouch hanging from her belt and crushed them in her hands. Next she poured water over them from Crest's canteen and turned the crushed leaves into a paste. He felt a sharp stinging sensation as she smeared the paste on the broken bridge of his nose. When Tilla was done she did her best to wipe away the gushing blood with her pocket handkerchief. Thanks, he said to her. You can thank me by replacing my hanky, she replied, this one will be completely ruined when I'm done. Sorry, winced Crest. Within a minute Tilla's handkerchief was soaked through, turning it a dark red. I need to stop the bleeding, Tilla said as she took the cloth away from Crest's nose. I didn't use enough herbs. As Tilla fumbled in her pouch for more dried leaves Myra found herself drawing closer to Crest. She felt her magic stirring inside her. Heal him, a little voice in the back of her mind whispered to her. Use your magic. Myra brought up her right hand and placed her fingertips on the broken bridge. She knew what she had to do. She focused on the warm and fuzzy feeling that thrummed through her core and felt it travel down her arm and through her fingers. At the same time Myra could feel Crest's pain leaving him and entering her hand. There was a grinding sound as the bone and cartilage were reset. Crest gave a short cry, leaping to his feet. He tenderly touched his nose and realized to his astonishment that it wasn't broken anymore. He looked dumbfounded at the young she-elf. At last he gathered his wits and thanked her. If only I had your power, Tilla said as she looked at Myra's hand. You wouldn't if you could feel what I'm feeling right now, hissed Myra as she cradled her now throbbing hand. She knew that the pain would dissipate over the next several minutes but until then she was forced to grit her teeth and bear it. I owe you a great weary good, Myra, said Crest, you've given me my good looks back. Ha, laughed Tilla, that's debatable. Crest opened his mouth to say something but then thought better of it. It wasn't worth starting an argument. He was too grateful for having his nose healed.